All right. Well, this morning, um, it's always interesting for me whenever um, I get to preach on a Father's Day um, because growing up in church, I've always thought of a couple of things. Uh, I don't know if this has been anyone else's experience, but we come to Mother's Day and it's like, oh, how wonderful mothers are and how great things are and how nice. And then we come uh, about a month later to Father's Day and it's like, all right, dads, now y'all need to get with it. Y'all need to get on the ball. Uh, has that been anybody else's experience sometime? Well, I want to tell you this Sunday morning that I am going to give you a little bit of grace this morning in terms of the point of the message this morning. However, I'm going to tell you right now, not everybody in the crowd is a father. That does not let you off the hook for what God wants to share with you this morning, okay? Because even if you aren't a father, you all have a father, right? I'm, I'm not so with it, not so out of the loop as far as things that, is there anybody in here that would claim that they didn't have a father at all? Like, because if you did, the Bible still has you covered. The Bible says that God will be a father to the fatherless. So you're still not off the hook. So we are all children of some father. But as we think about fathers, you know, I titled this message Hanging in the Balance. Because a lot of times for a father or a dad, it's a matter of balancing a lot of things, right? It's a matter of balancing work. It's a matter of balancing being a good husband. It's a matter of balancing being a father to those children. And so you've got all of these, the analogy of spinning these plates and you keeping them going like in the old uh, variety show. And all of a sudden, as soon as you focus too heavily on one, the other one starts like wobbling and starting getting ready to fall. And you're like, oh, I got to get that going. And... Um, Anyway, as we, we start this morning, I sense a lot of times, at least me personally, and I may be the only one, but if so, uh, then this message is for me this morning. But sometimes there's just a sense of desperation to get it right. Maybe not even just as fathers, but as parents in general, right? Do you ever feel like that? You come to a point of evaluating and you're like, man, did I, did I mess up somewhere? Did I get it right? Did I? How's it go? Um, but to, to start out with, there are a bunch of sayings about fatherhood, and um, I'm going to throw some of these out here. Not all of them are necessarily about fatherhood specifically, but sometimes they're just relationships in general when someone is very much like another person, okay? And so uh, feel free to join in with me. Um, uh, there may be a quiz later. No, there probably won't be. But uh, first of all, if... Someone is just like their dad or their grandfather or what. We say they're a chip off the old block, all right? All right? Sometimes used in a little more negative context, we say that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, okay? Now, this is not necessarily parent-child relationships, but sometimes it can if we have a good relationship and, and friendship with a child of ours, you can say that a couple of folks are like two peas, okay? Uh, birds of a feather, okay? That they are cut from the same cloth, that someone is a dead ringer, you know, that they look just like them, uh, that they are the spitting image, okay? If something tends to just be the same from generation to generation, we say it runs in the family, okay? Um, if someone accuses someone of something and it is the speck in my eye, plank in their eye sort of situation, we say that's the pot calling the, yep, all right, um, Sometimes it's six of one, uh, half dozen of another. If they're just two pieces of the same, we call them Tweedledee, and I'm usually the Tweedledum, but yeah. Um, 
We also say of when that kid starts growing up and starts showing characteristics or features of either parent, we say that you marked them, right? You left your mark on them, you know? Um, or here's the one, this one sometimes negatively, you really are your father's son, okay? Um, and then the, actually, this one I come to find out came from scripture, but not in the way we would think. How often have you heard like father, son? Actually, in Ezekiel 4, uh, 16, 44, it says this, it says, look, everyone who uses Proverbs will quote this proverb about you, like mother, like daughter. So actually in scripture, it's actually the flip, but we are more commonly associated with like father, like son. But I use that one to segue into another place in scripture because they said this proverb like daughter, or like mother, like daughter, and it's actually referring to some bad things if you read that prophet. But I want to point to a particular verse, and it's not necessarily specific to fathers. It's specific to parents in general. But I want to hang here for a second. If you want to turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. And I know quite a few of you probably could, if I gave you the start of this one, you could probably jump right into it as well. We have it on the screen there as well. And it says, teach a youth about the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Or some other versions you may have says, train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they won't depart from it. Now, how many a parent have clung tenaciously to that verse a lot of times? Well, here's my first question. Is that verse a promise of God or is it a proverb? Now, you'd be like, well, John, it's right there. It's in the book of Proverbs, right? But what does that mean exactly? What's the difference between a, prover a promise and a proverb? Are we just splitting hairs, semantics here? I would say no, because here's the thing. This verse was never meant to be understood as an absolute promise, but a statement of probability, okay? It was meant as a statement of probability. I'll give you a, a groundwork for this. In the book of Proverbs, uh, many of you know Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Now, is that a promise of God? No, it's just a statement of fact. It's if you trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and in all of your ways, acknowledge him, then your paths are going to be straight. It doesn't say your paths are going to be easy. It doesn't going to say that your paths are not going to have obstacles or problems but they will be straight. They will lead to God. And so that, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, is a statement of simple fact. But here's the thing. The book of Proverbs we know was written by Solomon, okay? A lot of those Proverbs were collected and sayings that were brought together by Solomon into this book. And the style of, and content of Solomon's Proverbs in that book actually change noticeably when you get to about chapter 10 of that book. In fact, there are numerous Proverbs in the latter section of the book of Proverbs which can hardly be taken as absolute promises for God. If you've ever written, 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 read through the book of Proverbs, there we go. Um, in fact, uh, it's almost like God intended for us to include a little bit of this in our daily devotional reading because how many chapters did he give us in the book of Proverbs? Anybody happen to know? 31. And at most, our months have 31 days in them. So it's almost like he meant for us to get in about a chapter a day 
And then you partner that with the Psalms and you've got a pretty good start to a devotional life. But uh, I digress. And so let's move on. A proverb now versus a promise. A proverb is a literary device whereby a general truth is brought to bear on a specific situation. In other words, you're stating what the general tendency of a thing is, but it's not necessarily always, all the time, for all time, okay? It's not going to always going to be that way. Just like some of these colloquialisms that I was introducing us with, they're not always true, right? Is every kid that was ever born just a chip off the old block? Mm -mm. No. Is every child that's born the spitting image of their parents? I know some people are like, I hope not. Um, but but the, the point is, is that in general, a lot of these things hold true. And so the problem with that is that many of the Proverbs are not an absolute guarantee, but we try to hold on to them as if they were. Okay. I'll give you some examples of. Uh, in that same chapter of chapter 22, if you're looking there, and I might ought to get there, but if you're looking in chapter 22 of Proverbs, just by way of example of how some of these things are not promises, um, verses three and four, it says this, a sensible person sees danger and takes cover, but the inexperienced keep going and are punished, Okay. That's not a always for all time for true, but it generally holds true. Okay. Verse nine, a generous person will be blessed for he shares his food with the poor. Now, there are generous people that are blessed and there are generous people that share their food with the poor. But is just sharing your food with the poor the definitive of being a generous person? There are lots of ways that people are generous. And so... Verse 11, the one who loves a pure heart and gracious lips, the king is his, his friend. I know we wish that were true nowadays, right? We wish that most all kings were friends with people who had and loved a pure heart and gracious lips. But all too often we see that with leaders and kings in our world that this is not generally holding true very much these days, okay? And so uh, verse 16, oppressing the poor to enrich oneself and giving to the rich both lead only to poverty. Now, that's one that it may have been generally true at the time this was written, but I would say that in the ultimate reckoning thus far, this has not totally panned out in every case. There are plenty of folks that continue to oppress the poor just to enrich themselves and only have scratch your back, I scratch your back sort of relationships, and it hasn't led to their poverty in any way. In fact, uh, we ask the question a lot of time, even scripture asks the questions, why does it seem like the evil person prospers and the righteous continue to have difficulty? And then verse 29, it says, do you see a person skilled in his work? He will stand in the presence of kings. He will not stand in the presence of the unknown. Do not express promise. Oh, he will not stand in the presence of the unknown. So um, I know there are quite a few folks that are highly skilled in what they do. Uh, uh, not to put you on the spot, but Brother Johnny is a good uh, man when it comes to electrical and all of those sorts of matters. But how many kings have you stood in the presence of, Brother Johnny? Okay, so just because you're skilled in your work doesn't mean that you're always going to be in front of kings. And so that's my point is that these Proverbs, they make a general statement about things that were a trend, but they're not necessarily true in like a promise of God sort of thing. Things like, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Okay, things that while you were yet sinners, my son died for you. These are the things that are the promises of God that we hold on to. But we want to take the same verse, train up a child in the way that they should go. In other words, as long as I make sure that they made it to vacation Bible school, they make it to Sunday school, they make it into Wednesday night. And if the pastor's there to clean the windows, then we'll be in the pew taking up our spot. As long as I do all of those things, 
My child's going to be a good child, right? That's what we want to cling to a lot of times in our darkest of little places inside when we think about it. But more often than not, this promise is, this is not a promise that's binding like that. Though the Proverbs are generally and usually true, occasional exceptions may be noted. And here we can see a couple of exceptions. For example, if train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it, were a promise of God, then we could automatically assume godly parents, godly kids. Ungodly parents, ungodly kids. Is that always the way it works out? In fact, if that were true, we would have neither one of these exceptions, and they are rife throughout Scripture. They are all over Scripture, these examples. I've just grabbed a few here this morning. But first of all, godly fathers should produce godly sons, right? If that was a promise of God, then godly fathers should automatically produce godly sons. But here are a few examples. Jotham fathered Ahaz. And it's said of them in scripture that Ahaz reigned 16 years in Jerusalem and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his ancestor, but made his son to pass through the fire. In other words, this guy was so ungodly as a king and a ruler that he sacrificed his own children through the fire. According to the abominations of the heathen, and he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Now, Jotham was literally the father of Ahaz. Ahaz's wicked behavior, sacrificing people, idol worship, and all of these things are in sharp contrast with his father, Jotham, who we read thus of Jotham. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. So here, case in point, godly parent, ungodly son. Hezekiah. Hezekiah was one that turned back to the Lord many times. It was one of the few goodly kings that we have in all of those study of kings in the Old Testament. But he fathered Manasseh. And Manasseh was one of the most wicked men mentioned in the Bible. He has gone down in history as probably being the worst king to ever reign over the nation of Judah when they were divided into two kingdoms. And it would be hard to find a more righteous father than Hezekiah and a more dis... I just can't even describe with words what Manasseh was by comparison. Another great example that shows you in sharp contrast, we hear about Eli, okay? At the time when Samuel is brought to the temple and Samuel is brought to the temple as dedicated as an offering to God. But Eli, we hear he has two wicked sons that don't even survive to succeed him in the priesthood because of their wickedness and their nastiness. And Eli, we hear from scripture, he didn't do his job. Ungodly father, ungodly sons. Okay, the pattern fits there. So now Samuel, he's brought up listening to the Lord's voice, following the Lord's voice. So surely Samuel's going to have some children that follow the Lord but he doesn't. His sons are not quite as bad as Eli's sons, but they're still just as bad in their own right, in their sin and their unrighteousness. And so Samuel, he was one of the most dedicated and righteous prophets and judges in the Old Testament, and he had two of the most wicked sons, Joel and Abijah. They did the unthinkable by taking bribes for the Lord's service. They also perverted justice. They would tip the scales of justice in the favor of folks that were their buddies, their friends, or could do something for them and would oppress those that truly needed justice on their side. We also have the example of Isaac who had Esau and Jacob, okay? Isaac was a son of promise within the family hierarchy of Abraham's lineage and Esau and Jacob were both disappointments in their own right because Esau 
didn't see his role and his legacy within the family as something worth being held on to. In fact, he traded it for lunch one day after working out in the field. Jacob saw anything that he could take, scrap, and take away as being important. And he was known as a liar and a deceiver. But yet Isaac was consistently presented as one who is spiritually stable and walked with God. There are more godly fathers and ungodly sons mentioned, actually, than ungodly fathers with godly sons in Scripture, if you would believe that. There are more cases where a person was righteous and ended up having unrighteous children than there are of the other exception where ungodly fathers managed to, by some stroke of the grace of God, have a godly child. But we spoke about uh, these kings, Ammon fathered Josiah. Josiah stands out in Bible history as one of the most eminent kings of Judah. He was eight years old when his reign began, and he was an unusually righteous and godly man. Josiah addressed the idolatry, and he made sweeping reforms throughout the nation. But both his grandpa and his dad were infamously wicked. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. And we've already spoken about how Hezekiah was a very righteous and good king who tried to turn back to the Lord and bring folks back to the Lord. But Ahaz, his father, was terribly ungodly. We find that in 2 Kings 16, 2 and 4. Um, Abijam fathered Asa. Asa was Judah's first righteous king in the line of kings. And Asa was so godly while his father Abijam was so wicked. And then uh, one of my namesakes from the Bible, Jonathan, was fathered by King Saul. And we know the kind of things that King Saul struggled with. He was one of the saddest records and examples of a tormented failure within the kingship of the nation of Israel. Saul was a hardened and ungodly father. Jonathan was special, caring, and sensitive. But Saul was denounced as a spiritual rebel. In fact, when he couldn't get the things that he wanted in the time frame that he wanted them, he would go about, kind of like us, his own means to make sure that he did what he thought was supposed to happen. So what are the things that really do make a good father? Or what are those fatherly factors? Well, one, the faith of our fathers. We sang the hymn this morning. From the very start, Adam was to teach and pass on his faith to his family. Okay? Notice something if you go back and you look at that passage of Adam in the garden. When God puts him in the garden, he commands the command about you may eat from all of the trees of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He gives that command to Adam. In fact, we find a little bit later is when we have the account of the creation of Eve. Now, you think, well, isn't that weird? Because then Eve is the one that's talking about it with the serpent later as we get to the account of the fall. I don't think that's unintentional, okay? Because God intended for Adam within his household and within his family to be the teacher of his family and teach them to observe the things that God had commanded them. And it was one simple command at the beginning, wasn't it? You need anything? Just don't eat that. And we find that it was a little too much to keep up with even there. Well, let's move forward a little bit in history. We move to Noah. Noah was considered a righteous man in his time because God decided he would be the one that would be saved from a corrupt and terrible generation. So surely if God was going to reset and restart things afresh with this person he considered righteous, surely we're going to get it right then, aren't we? Well, Noah, after he finally gets back on dry land, he plants himself a vineyard and he makes him a little house uh, batch and he has a little too much enjoyment of that house batch and 
he finds himself just precariously disgraceful. And amongst his own children, one of them does a shameful thing of mocking and making fun of their father in his sad, sad state following the flood. You know, I mean, you think about it. Noah, I'm not making excuses for Noah, but Noah experienced something none of us, we've all experienced tragedy. We've all seen horrible things happen. But could you imagine if you had seen the entire world destroyed? And now it's all on your shoulders to rebuild it. I'm not making excuses for him finding some solace in a bottle, but I know that there are a lot of men out there that would do the same thing under the circumstances. But yet and still his own children, one out of the three of them ends up being cursed from his disrespecting and dishonoring his father. And so then we move forward a little bit further and we see that it develops into this, this, patriarchal passing on of the faith through generations. Uh, we had the old song in, in Sunday school and Bible school, Father Abraham had many sons. And it points to the idea that the early start of Israel was this passing on of a legacy of faith. So the faith of our fathers. But then we come to the law that God gave Moses. And then there's the duty of the dad and not duty, but duty as in service, okay? Um, the duty of the dad, it's commanded in the Shema, Deuteronomy 4, uh, 6, 4 through 9, where he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. These laws that I am giving to you are to be on your hearts. There's to be in your homes. They're to be discussed when you're walking and talking and doing your work. In other words, dads, you're to impart these things to your kids, and to your families. Interestingly enough, nowhere in scripture did God ever rescind that initial instruction that we see started with Abraham, come through Noah, come through the patriarchs, and then laid down in the law and the Shema. In fact, we see quite the opposite. Towards the end of the prophets, Malachi 4, 4 through 6 says, in those last days, I will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. In other words, I'm going to put that focus back in their hearts that they would be focused on training up a child in the way that they should go. And then the promotion to parent. We had the faith of our fathers, the duty of our dads, and then the promotion to parent. Um, I come to a little bit more modern thing for this. You know, whenever you become a parent, it's scary. There's no instruction manuals out there except for this one, of course. But, you know, looking for one that tells you, okay, how much screen time is right for a kid or not? Uh, how many times should I take them fishing? How many times should I take them hunting? You know, all of these little factors that roll into a thing of what does it take to be a good parent? And I think part of that is in the passing on of that mantle and that legacy. Um, we spoke about that, but um, there was a movie quite a few years back now uh, that you may have seen the faith-based film by the Sherwood Pictures folks called Courageous. And it has some of my favorite funny moments for a movie and stuff, but it has this one really powerful point where all the men and guys are hanging out, having a little backyard barbecue sort of situation. And they're talking about different things and they're talking about fatherhood and what they remember about their dads and such. And the main character says this, he says, someone says, well, you're a good enough dad. And he says, I don't want to be a good enough father. We have a few short years to influence our kids. Whatever patterns we set for them in life will be used for their kids and the generation after that. We have the responsibility to mold a life. And I don't think that should be done casually. Half the fathers in this country are already failing and I don't want to be one of them. 
I'm talking about setting the standards that they need to aim for in life. And I can tell you on one hand, that quote just like hits me right to the gut when I read that, when I hear it, when I see that scene within the movie. Because another thing he says in that same scene is that I believe that God has called me to call out the man within my son. And if I were to ask that question, I would not ask for any raise of hands or anything of that nature, but how many of us men really feel like someone actually called out the man who was supposed to be within us? You know, that they passed on that mantle, that there was some moment, there was some rite of passage to where all of a sudden, yes, I feel like I have this charge, I have this responsibility, I have this ability, and I can do this with God's help. I'm going to tread on dangerous ground here, and I might break down because of it, but I want to say it. Someone on social media asked this question. They're doing like one of these journaling things where they ask a question a day and looking for responses. And they asked the question, when did this whole being an adult thing really, did you feel like you were really being an adult? And honestly, I've had little ins and outs about it. But when my own dad passed away, it felt like, you know, we have dads all the time that say the statement about, well, as soon as you get out of college on your own, that money tree is getting chopped down. You know, know, there's not going to be just this handout or this or that or the other. But in reality, when there was that realization that I couldn't just pick up the phone and call for advice guidance, and I really was on my own. That was when it set in. But how much more gracious would it be if that mantle could have been passed to say, you can still ask me for things, but you're going to do fine. So, but I don't want to just leave it at fathers and children. I also want to say that there is a grace to being a grand, okay? When you're a grandparent, now we make fun of it a lot of times about the fact that, you know, they ship them off to grandma and grandpa's and the grandma says, well, just let them have one little snack and they have the huge, massive chocolate bar that they're handing them and stuff. But the thing is, most of our grandparents have been seasoned to the point where things that are really serious for us in the moment as parents they've learned that down the line, it's really not as big a deal as we think it is in that moment. And so they're able to be the grace and the balance to the equation that is parenting and raising up a child. In fact, Titus says something to the effect of that in Titus 2, 1 through 5, and it talks about how those grandparents are to take in that relationship. But Okay, if we handle all of these things, if we handle all of our business as a parent or as a father, then why doesn't this hold as just a promise that if we train them up in the way they should go, why isn't it just automatic that when they grow old, they won't depart from it? Well, these are the X and the Y factor. One, every child that was ever born still has free will. While the Bible teaches environment and physical heredity as of importance, the Bible also presents man as the master of their own destiny. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, and it says that man can and often does rise above a spiritually disadvantaged background. But to the contrary, some reject all the spiritual advantages they were offered by their parents. So parents and children each have their respective responsibilities and each must give an account is what scripture tells us that each of us individually will stand before God for what we have or what we haven't done with him. And so because of that, there's 
There's no way we can automatically say just because you do all the things that you're supposed to do as a father, that automatically means you're going to have a godly child that honors God. Because they still have a choice. They still have the ability, just like you had the ability. There's also the factor of external influences. And boy, do those external influences look like they just swirl and swirl with more and more danger and power as each generation passes. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says it this way, Do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. So you can raise up a child in the best way possible, and still, if they fall into the wrong crowd, or as Brother Butch said this morning in the Sunday school lesson, in the wrong place, at the wrong time, it can lead to bad things. And you know, while these things are pitfalls or possibilities that can ruin what we would hope would be a promise, ultimately we do want our children's faith to be personal. We want it to be something that they themselves have taken ownership of. Because what we have seen in the foregoing is consistent with the teaching of Ezekiel 18.20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. You know, we talk about the concept of uh, sin from Adam and the sinful nature and those sorts of things. But if we die without Christ, the only person's sin that will separate us from God is ours. Okay? Okay. We're not held to account for the sins of our parents, of our grandparents, of our great, 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 great times a bazillion parents, okay? We are held accountable for our sin, plain and simple. And then along those same lines, God hasn't ever had a grandchild. Scripture doesn't speak of any grandchildren of God. Uh, There was a gospel group quartet called Truth that had a song by this title that said, God ain't never had a grandchild, only a child will do. And that is true of us today. We have to be adopted into the family of God through coming to Christ. We can't rely on the faith of our parents. We can't rely on the faith of our brothers, sisters, grandparents, or otherwise. And while they can do a lot to guide the way for us, they can't do it for us. Our faith must be personal. We must take responsibility for our own sin, and we must walk in that way that God has called us to. So as we come to a time of invitation, there are a lot of godly parents out there who have sorrowed over a child that did not turn out the way that they desired. They've compounded their grief by unjustly blaming themselves. Sometimes there's this thought that runs through our minds and we don't like to talk about it, but we tend to think if the children do not turn out to be Christians, it's the parents' fault. They must have failed. I don't think scripture presents that. The conclusion that fault must automatically be assumed is faulty and sometimes even sinful because it produces a neurotic guilt that, well, maybe I didn't give them the right bicycle on their seventh Christmas or something like that. And all it does is it gets us tangled up in a web of things where we're not continuing to do what God has called us to do because we're worried about that. Such views not only add to the hurt of grieving parents, but they can also disrupt an entire church. A lot of times we can pass that same thing into our understanding of the requirements for a person to be a leader within the church. And we say, oh, because of your child and the way your child's acting, there ain't no way that you have a godly household. So we can't let you be in a place of leadership. God definitely didn't call you because your child is this. Well, your child is 30, 40 years old now. They make their own decisions, okay? Um, the point is we cannot judge people on their children. You know, I was a teacher at one point, and that was one of the things that I most hated about teaching because We've let this Eastern philosophy sink in. It was espoused in some of the Karate Kid movies where 
says there's no such thing as bad student, only bad teacher. Well, that's a bunch of hogwash, okay? Because there is no other profession in this world where a person gets evaluated based on the actions of others. Each person should be evaluated on their own merit and their own work and what they have done. And each person that they are trying to lead or teach or otherwise deal with has the free will whether to take that in and grow with it or say, I don't buy none of it and be rebellious. And that's the way it always has been. And that's the way it's probably going to continue to be until the Lord comes back. But the point there is that we can't just automatically say, Apple don't far fall from the tree. Okay? In that regard, such views are terrible. And what it leads to is you have to evaluate yourself. You have to look at yourself by the standard that God has set there. And if your conscience is clear before the Lord that you did everything you could to the best of your ability to be obedient to him in training up that child, that you can take heart and stop blaming yourself for the mistakes of your children. Because there is way more than enough pressure to go around on parents these days without you adding to it by saying, well, I just ruined it all. You can't make their decisions for them or control their relationship with God. If they've rebelled against you and rejected your faith in spite of your best efforts to diffuse their hostile attitude and behavior, take some comfort in a couple of things. One, the thought that you have been faithful to the responsibilities and obligations that God gave you as a parent. One. And then bear in mind, too, that the final chapter of their story is yet to be written. As long as there is life, there is hope. God is able to use the youthful errors to teach them valuable lessons and bring them at last to a place of humility and repentance. Remember the exact words in which Proverbs 22 expresses its statement of probability. When he is old, he will not depart from it. So the general trend is if you do the right things, that somewhere down the line, there is hope that they will stick to the path.